from New York. I am Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS. The handsome gentleman next to me is my old school friend, Mr. Roger Harper, who is a former West Indies cricketer turned coach. He played both Test and ODI cricket for the West Indies. His international career lasted 13 years from 1983 to 1996, and he was last later described as a fabulous fielder. His test bowling average of 28.06 is superior to that of Lance Gibbs, giving him the leading average among all West Indian spinners with at least 25 test wickets. One of his most notable performances was against South Africa in the quarterfinals of the 1996 Cricket World Cup when he, look, he took 4 for 47 to allow the West Indies to seize control of the match. Roger, welcome to CWS, brother. Good evening, Selvin. So, so Good evening to all our viewers, and I want to just want to say the flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> all right, buddy, it's you and me here tonight. When those close to you describe you, what is usually accurate about the way they describe you? <laughs> those, those close to me. Um, well, well, most people think I'm very responsible. Mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, you know I, I, I'm, the, I'm the sort of person that tend to take charge, take charge of situations when you know, things, things need to get, to get done. So they, so they look to me a bit for leadership. So, so they think I'm responsible and they think, you know, that I'm capable of taking the helm and pointing the direction that needs to be started. Give us a glimpse of Roger growing up in Guyana, the nine-year-old Roger and Roger at 15. Well, nine-year-old Roger by then knew that he wanted to be a professional cricketer mm -hmm. and um, spent a lot of his free time playing with friends in the backyard at the side of the, uh, of the Demerara Cricket Club ground on the what we call the sand reef, a little sand area just off the playing surface where we would have our mini test matches. And that's where a lot of um, players hone their skills. Also, um, one who had a lot of fun, but understood the importance and had no choice really because of, um, you know, the seriousness of my mother, understood the importance of education as well. Roger at... 50? 15. Uh, 15, yes, sorry. Oh, at 15, was able to build on the aspirations of the nine-year-old. I remember uh, when I was 10, 11 years old, going on to 11 in um, common entrance class, as we called it back then, and was asked to write an essay on the school I wanted to attend. And of course, uh, I chose to write about Queen's College. And I got top marks for that essay. But the, my teacher, Mrs. Bradshaw, asked to see me after class. And she said, uh, that was an excellent essay. But um, you want to go to Queen's College because of the sports facilities they offer? <laughs> well, that was, I mean, that was not one of the why I wanted to go there. Cricket pitches, you know, table tennis tables, badminton, all the sports were available there. So that was my, my reason and that was what I wrote about. He complimented me on the quality of the essay, but not on the reasons. <laughs> you know, that, that you mentioned Queen's College. Um, tonight, um, uh, Cakes, Ju Julian, Charles and I were talking about, we were talking about a year you actually started playing for QC. And I remember... Uh, we went in there in 74, and I remember you playing. You said at nine years old, you knew you wanted to play professional cricket. Yes, um, huh? now Sir Garfield Sobers was the hero of uh, all aspiring West Indian cricketers, and everyone wanted to be like him. So that was very easy. In addition to that, I had a cricket mad brother who was almost six, and still is almost six years older than I am. And, you know, I followed him around, and the cricket bug passed on. So, you know, that was very easy. When, when Roger, did you actually realize you can play? 
uh, from an early age, I knew I was a little better than the, you know, my peers, the uh, kids my age. And um, so I knew I had a little bit of talent, but I was always playing with the older guys. Like I said, I was play, following my brother around and he's almost six years older than I am. And he played a lot with my cousin, later um, Fred Woods Jr., you know, in their yard. And as the youngest person in the group, I had to do a lot of bowling when no one else was available and a lot of fielding. But um, because you were playing with the older ones, you got a little tougher. And of course, you know, you managed to develop skills that um, you wouldn't develop as quickly playing with um, kids your own age. Julian asked, wanted, to, uh, uh, wanted to know when you first started playing at QC per se. What age? For the school? Um, I, I, I recall playing, I think, in first form. First form. Or, or, yeah. 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 And I'll, I'll call some names from QC. And just tell me what comes to mind immediately. Andy Jackman. Andy, Andy Jackman. Well, he's actually from North Georgetown, right? but he's so. North Georgetown, but outstanding player, outstanding batsman. With... Neil Barry. Neil Barry. Neil Barry. Well, I played, well, I played more with uh, at school with Neil's brother Thomas, who was in my class, my year, and he was a couple of uh, years behind. But Neil is a very tough uh, character and tough cricketer. Well, and he, of course, is very talented and went on to play for Guyana and did so, you know, with some distinction. Colvin Court. Colvin, Colvin Court. Again, a couple of years behind me at Queen's College, but, a, uh, 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 you know, a very uh, talented fast bowler who was able to move the ball around and, you know, he had his moment in the sun for Guyana as well. Roger Charles. Well, that's, I think, is a sportsman supreme. I think he had it all. He, I think he was spoiled for choice. That was his problem. Mm -hmm. Outstanding athlete, you know, two and 400 meters, uh, four in particular. Good basketball player, was able to represent Guyana on the 19th level. Very, very capable footballer. And, of course, you know, a quality fast bowler. Play. We played our youth cricket together for Guyana. Roger Boxill. Roger Boxill, the great Wallaby, the legend of, of Queen's College. Yes, um, he was a, 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 a very uh, an outstanding performer for Queen's College. He formed a very formidable fast bowling uh, partnership with Oren Gordon. For Queen's I was just College, about to ask you about Oren Gordon. Destroyed a number of um, teams, both in the school's competition and in the White Cup. You're a spinner. When did your or how did your spinning develop? And when did you realize, I got it? Actually, actually when I started off at Queen's College, I was bowling medium pace. Mm. And I would, often, I would often, while bowling at that sort of medium pace, try to spin the ball to get it to deviate. And I think it was Lonsdale Skinner who came around uh, I think through the Ministry of Sport, I think, on a coaching assignment at the various schools, he came to Queen's College, and he suggested that I should uh, take up uh, spin bowling instead. I think it will, you know, be more uh, something that I could really benefit from and have more to offer. So I followed his advice, and uh, success started to come my way. Did you ever resort back to? Did you? Did you? Did you ever? like switch between the two or you just stuck with, with spin? Once I, Once I started bowling spin, I just continued with it. Do you remember the first, um, well, you've out a lot of men, but the one that really made you like, yeah, I, I got it. Well, there are a number of uh, prize wickets mm -hmm. that that you you get you know i think um one of them in particular would have been um alan border uh, another one would be someone like david gower you know javid mean that but um, but, um it, in in some cases it has more to do with the situation than the player you know, because um, during that year, there are a number of high-quality players. 
But I think, but I think um, getting, you know, an important, an important breakthrough, breakthrough at, a, at a, a moment when the team really needed a wicket, you know, is, you know, is what really gives you that sense of satisfaction. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Take, take us back to that match against South Africa in the quarterfinals, the 1996 World Cup uh, cricket when you did the 4 for 4 to 7, right? Yeah. What yeah. is going through your mind at the time, if you remember? And, and describe how it felt when you took the last two wickets. Well, well uh, I, can tell, I can tell you from before the match started, part of the preparation would have been watching the South Africans play in some of their other games. And, and it, 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 it just... Shot out at, at, at me in particular that they were very good uh, sweepers of the ball, and mostly uh, you know that's how they played a lot of the that's how they took the attack to the spinners they played against and our spinners in particular. So um, my strategy really was to take the length away from them, not allow them to sweep, and using my height be able to get a little extra bounce to make that a little more difficult for them. And once I was able to do that, they struggled to score. And, and even, even though they had a good start, we managed to peg them back and not being able to score freely against myself. And also, I think Jimmy Adams bowled as well, and he got a couple of wickets. They took a few risks, and that's when um, the wickets came. Wow. Wow. You talked about Queen's College and playing for QC. How did those early days prepare you for, for, the, for your journey as a cricketer? I think, I think that was the, the, the foundation, that was the platform on which the rest of my career was built. Because at Queen's College, I played a lot of cricket. We played into house cricket, into farm cricket, into um, where in the, in the same form we'll play against a different class, into class 1A versus 1B, that sort of thing. I played, when I was in uh, first and second form, I often played... Uh, for my form against another form in QC or against another school, and then would come back in the afternoon to represent Queen's College at the White Cup just after lunch. So I would have a whole day of it. I really played a lot of cricket at school, and I think uh, what's lacking now is the fact that you know there's no real organized cricket as such in our schools. Okay, there's a school competition that's being run, but you know. The players are not being properly prepared, and there are no proper practice um, practice sessions for those kids preparing for these matches. No coaches work with them on any sort of long-term basis. And I think guys are just turning up and playing. You can see from the way the matches go that that is exactly the case. The teams that have players who are playing at clubs often succeed. In test cricket, which is the most formidable team you ever played against? I'd have to say Pakistan. Ah, huh. why? And, and especially in Pakistan. Pakistan always had a, a, a knack for giving the West Indies trouble. They were always very talented players. And I think that um, they, they, they backed themselves against our bowling attack. And um, they had players who were capable of playing the fast bowlers very well. And when they got to Pakistan in their own backyards, you know, they were that much more comfortable and that much more challenging. So um, they, if you look at the records, we always had, even when we dominated world cricket, we always had a tough time against Pakistan. Mm -hmm. If you could pick a team today, Roger, with guys from the old days, who will definitely make the first five? I know that's a tough one, but that's a very tough. One. <laughs> but um, I think that um, the opening pair, I think Gordon Greenwich, mm. Desmond Haynes, Conrad Hunt, Roy Frederick, those days, those, those guys would certainly be considered. But um, no doubt, sir. Isaac Bibb and Alexander Richard would walk in there. I think consideration would have to be given to one by Charles Lara. Uh -huh. But then as well, you know, you have Sir Garfield Sobel 
and you have people like uh, Sir Everton Reed, uh -huh. to consider, and um, Clyde Walker, you know, players with outstanding test record. So that would be a very, very difficult uh, first five to pick. But it's a good problem to have when you're speaking of your cricketing uh, history or your legacy. Roger, you, you have grown up around cricket. You, from what I understand, you live, you eat and breathe cricket. As a child watching Rohan Kanai and uh, Sir Garfield Sobers and so on, if you had to, if it came down to either one and you had to pick one, who would you pick and why? Well, I think Sobers would get the edge beyond a doubt because of his all-round ability. I mm. think he would make most teams on the basis of his batting. And if you put that aside, make most teams on the basis of his bowling because he offers you a variety of styles as well and he's very capable in each of those. You know, whether it's um, bowling um, pace, where he's swinging the ball around, bowling orthodox left arm spin, or bowling his Chinaman Goodly. So, and he's an outstanding fielder as well. So I think um, from that perspective, you have to give him the edge. Mm. Lawrence Romeo, what are your plans, if any, to develop cricket in Guyana and the West Indies in general? It's your friend, boy. At the moment, <laughs> I'm president of the Georgetown Cricket Association. And we work hard to ensure that we provide opportunities for clubs in Georgetown. And I say clubs because even though there are clubs in Georgetown, a number of our players come from outside of Georgetown because of the quality of cricket that's available in Georgetown and how well organized it is. Mm. And um, we run through um, development programs and clinics as well to try to upskill our players. But... Um, at the moment, that's what we're doing, making sure that our cricketers in, in Georgetown have the opportunities to compete, to showcase their talent, and we run programs as well to help them to take their skills to the next level. Uh, as far as Guyana and the West Indies are concerned, there are some problems there that need to be sorted out. It's out of our hands, really. Mm -hmm. It's disappointing in Guyana, for example, that a large section of the cricket fraternity including the Georgian Cricket Association, feel that the Guyana Cricket Board's current executives didn't get there by, you know, legal means as far as their constitution is concerned of the board. And based on what the, the chaos that, you know, ensued following the initial um, so-called elections when they got there, uh, a cricket bill went to Parliament and came an act, but it hasn't been implemented. You know, we're still waiting on that to be implemented to sort of end the chaos and bring some a sense of organization and unify all parties in the cricketing fraternity again. Mm. What, 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 what do you think is the greatest holdup? What is the greatest holdup? Yeah. Well, I understand there's an injunction against the Minister of Sport and the Attorney General. Oh. Government. Oh inherited from the last government. Mm. But uh, to my knowledge, no move has been made to try to remove that injunction to have that case reopened because uh, our lawyers told us that it's very frivolous, uh, you know, mm -hmm. case that is brought against them and should be, you know, only a matter of course to have that removed. But that, uh, that hasn't been done yet. No attempt has been made to have it Mm. Lawrence Romeo again. Do you see a way back for West Indies cricket in the longer formats of the game? I think, of course, there's a way back for West Indies cricket uh, all round. But I think uh, we need uh, visionary leadership, leadership more focused on taking our cricket where it belongs. And I just don't have a sense of uh, that that is the case at the moment. If you had to make a case for that, and you had to 
lay out three points that can help move cricket to where you believe it belongs. What three points would you make? Well, firstly, you build from the bottom. You know, even if you're, you can paint your penthouse and redecorate it as much as you like, if your foundation is shaky, you know, and not good, your penthouse may look good, but it's going to be rocking. And that's exactly what's happening now. As well as we need to revisit some of the structures and systems that we had in place years ago and try and see if we can recreate them in an improved manner that can help to develop our players in a similar way that they came through and were developed years ago. And I think that um, the relationship between our players and our administrators would have to be better as well. Okay. That first time you played with, um, for the West Indies, the first game, do you remember the feeling, what, what you were thinking about? Of course, I'm playing for my first test match in India. You know, it was in Calcutta. Hmm. I think it must have been about a hundred and hundred and plus thousand, more than a hundred thousand people in the stands. And um, it was just a sense of elation to have gotten on the tour with the West Indies team. And then we have to step out onto the field with the likes of uh, behind uh, the great captain, Clive Lloyd, and with great players like Vivian Richards, Gordon Greenwich, and the like. But um, you knew as well then that, you know, you had to try and make sure you did your part so you could try and contribute to the team and try and remain there. So as much as elated as you were, there was still that sense of knowing that, you know, you still had a job to do and you have to try to do it as well as you can. Clive Lloyd, you mentioned him. I had the honor and privilege of interviewing him years ago. Tell us about the first time you played with him and what it meant to you. Well, Clive Lloyd was one of my boyhood heroes as well. Mm -hmm. And um, having watched him as a kid, his exploits, listened to him lead uh, West Indian teams abroad and in the Caribbean, and then being able to play with him, you know, that was uh, really a, a tremendous feeling sense of achievement. But um, he is really an easygoing um, character who lets us play, uh, uh, has the knack for making his, his players feel at home and uh, putting your mind at ease and give you the sense of belief and that confidence that you know, you're here because you're capable of performing at this level and he believes you can. And um, playing for Guyana, you know, that was the first time I uh, played with him. He was leading Guyana uh -huh. and uh, 1983. And um, yes, that was a tremendous feeling. And he led us to, to, to the double, actually. Julian Charles asked this. How was playing under Lloyd compared with playing under Viv Richards? Well, uh, I think Clyde Lloyd never really got the sort of recognition as a leader that he should have. Mm. And I think that um, people tend to say, well, oh, he had a lot of great players. But we've seen teams with great players not perform in the same manner that Clyde Lloyd's teams managed to perform. And what we must remember is when, those, when Lloyd started as captain in 1974, I think in India, that uh, or 76 in India, that a lot of those great players were now starting their careers. Mm. So they became great under his leadership. And um, he had a knack for bringing the team together. He was selfless in his approach, always put the team first, always made the sacrifices. And he led from the front. He never asked us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. 
Uh, so I think Bill or uh, Sir Isaac, yes. as he is now, yeah. was able to benefit from the systems, the structures that um, Clive had put in place. But Viv was a, you know, a more stronger character, so to speak, a little more brash than um, Clyde Lloyd was, but he demanded a certain level of effort and of performance as well. So the, the, the methods were, were very different, but I think the objectives were the same. Who was, well, actually, Carl in the chat room asked, who was more tolerant? Tolerant of? Just, just say who was more tolerant. I, can't, I, don't, I, don't. Well, I think, um, like I said, um, like Lloyd, you know, in those days we had core mm. you know? Um, and he expected players to be responsible, you know, to know when is the time to play and when is the time to be serious and when is the time to work hard, when is the time to have fun. And I think uh, the players uh, understood that and respected him for that. Of course, you have players that would transgress and there are always uh, penalties in place, you know, but um, in Biv inherited that system and structure as well. Oh, um, Carl Car said, oh, sorry, sorry, Roger, sorry. Carl said, um, of mistakes on the field. Of mistakes on the field. Well, Viv, I think, let his emotions hang out uh, <laughs> on a number of occasions. He was that sort of character, you know, while um, Clyde Lloyd had a different way of handling it. But I think, uh, I think Viv sometimes forgot that he was not of the ordinary cloth mm. that most men were cut from. And he had, at, at, on a number of occasions, expected people to play at his standard in everything they did. While um, from that perspective, I think um, Clyde Lord is a little more tolerant. With Viv, I think even if you were putting in the effort, once the performance wasn't up to where he expected it to be, he would let you know. Well, wow. But um, I think um, the skipper, skipper Lloyd, as he was called, he looked more for the application mm -hmm. and he thought with the application, consistent application, that you know, the results will come. Any, any tips you shared with either captain? Any tips I shared with either captain? Yes, tips on the game. Well, well or, or they shared with me, I mean, at that time, when I joined the team under Clive Lloyd's leadership, I was a very young player and looking to really soak in everything that I could, absorb it like a sponge and learn as much as I could. Of course, I had my own ideas because I had been captain team from very young, but that wasn't the time and place for me to go telling a senior <laughs> captain players what I think. You know, if I ask a question of the team, even of course, I give my view, but, um, you know, no, but... Um, you know, I did a lot of listening and a lot of learning. What surprised you the most about the West Indies team when you first started? Uh, well, I tell you what's a, what, what gave me a bit of a shock. Uh, when we got to India, you know, I always fancied myself as an outstanding fielder and a good catcher. First practice session, we had a... a bit of a training session with Dennis Wade, some running and that sort of thing. And then um, Clyde Lloyd said, okay, we're going to do some um, fielding practice. The slippers were over here and the outfielders over the other side. And he said, young half, you'd come with, with, with us here in the slips. So I needed to go to the washroom. And when I came back, they had already started. And I saw I think it was Michael Holding at the time, throwing it down at about 200 miles an hour, it looked at to me. And, 
and um, someone slashing it, and these guys catching. I said they expect me to join that, but um, you know, when you got in there and you got used to it and you got to catch it, then you realize why catching in matches was so simple because they you practice catching as you expected to catch in a match. You weren't practicing at 60 miles an hour when the guys were going to be bowling at 90 plus miles an hour in the match. You were actually practicing at the same sort of pace. So you're catching it at that sort of speed. So when you got to the matches, you know, it was something you'd be really used to. What do you tell a young, a young would-be player, a young cricketer that has a fear of fastball? What type of advice would you give him? Well, you know, if you're going to attain any heights as a cricketer, especially if you're a batsman, then you have to overcome that fear. And that can only become overcome through practice, developing your skill, mm -hmm. and giving yourself the confidence to deal with it. And there are a number of drills that you can, um, you know, do on a regular basis to overcome that fear. But uh, initially, I think you need to make sure that you use whatever protection is available and get into the habit of doing the drills that will give yourself the confidence of dealing with the, uh, with the fast, short pitch ball. And uh, you start slow, slowly until you, and build up the pace until you, 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 know, you feel you're really capable of doing it. Quick question before we take a break. Uh, Terence in the chat room asked, who is the best young guy in East Cricketer today? Best young Guyanese cricketer. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, of course, uh, Hetmeyer, and there's a, a young fellow also by the name of Timo Paul, an all rounder, very talented player. I think they're a place to watch for the future. Mm. Right, let's take a break. 